Good evening. It's going to be evening when this posts today. It's still afternoon right now in South Florida. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about lusting for results. How lusting for results ruins your magic. Uh, Alistair Crowley is famous for teaching his students to avoid lusting for results. Uh, it's unclear whether he was really able to benefit fully from that lesson, at least intellectually, he understood the principle. Uh, and so we're going to talk about what's behind that principle and why your desire for an end goal or why your goal focus is sabotaging your magic. This is from the Book of the Law. This is uh, just a quote from Crowley. Uh, explaining the principle of the lusting for results and how it can damage magic. Um, for pure will, unassuaged of purpose, delivered from the lust of result, is every way perfect. Unassuaged of purpose. What does that mean? It uh, means free of a specific goal, essentially. Uh, he would teach his students not to have a specific goal in mind. Um, and this might fly in the face of a lot of creative visualization practices because uh, very often uh, when you're taught to do creative visualization for manifesting things or, think, you know, or making a treasure map and visualizing the end result of your efforts, uh, you're very often advised to think specifically. Um, you can do that, but then of course there's it's okay to think specifically, but the problem is the attachment to the end result. Okay, if one were to visualize a specific goal, um, one should do that in a manner that indicates you're not attached to having your magic end up in that specific way. Something like that might come out. Maybe I can make it clearer later. <coughs> Excuse me. So in, in order to understand what the problem with lusting for result is, we have to delve into the mysteries of cause and effect. And we're gonna have to do some critical thinking here. This, this should be fun, it's, it's gonna be a quiz. First of all, let's talk about um, the way that cause and effect looks from the outside and then talk about the way that cause and effect looks from the inside. And what I mean by that, cause and effect to most people looks a certain way, but when you become an initiate and you start peeking behind the scenes of reality, uh, as Jan Fortune would say, you could see the actual machinery of the universe, um, then cause and effect doesn't look the same anymore. Okay, uh, let's talk about Okay, let's do some critical thinking, All right? <laughs> um, I run into this problem when I'm helping students develop the ability to think critically, okay? Uh, and this is going to be an eye-opener to many of you as well, because many of you think you know what a fact is, okay? There are actually two definitions of a fact. One definition of fact is something that's true, okay? When it comes to critical thinking, that's not really the definition of fact that we use. Okay, when it comes to the, uh, the context of fact and opinion, fact has another definition. Okay, so in, in that context, a fact is something that can be verified, something that can be proved true or false. Okay, facts can be false? What? Okay, well, that is one definition of a fact. Okay, uh, to make that clear, if you were to uh, sit in a courtroom during, during a trial, some of the facts presented during the case turn out to be false. There you have it. Okay, so a fact is, a, is logically speaking, in, in terms of pure logic, a fact is something that um, can be verified as true or false, conceivably. Okay. 
that's something to wrap your head around, okay? And as we as we do this little exercise here, you're going to find yourself possibly drifting back into true-false mode, okay? And remember, a fact in this context is not something that's true. It's something that can be verified as true or false, okay? Uh, the first statement, smoking is dangerous. Many people would say, oh, that's true. We know it's true. <laughs> well, you cannot verify whether something is dangerous. Now, you can provide lots of facts to back up that statement. Okay, so smoking is dangerous is an opinion. Okay, doesn't matter how many facts you can present to support that opinion. The way that it's stated there, it cannot be verified. I can't measure danger. There's no danger meter. Like, at what point does the needle go red and then become danger. I don't have a danger meter that can verify whether smoking is dangerous, okay? It's basically a subjective impression, a subjective impression that I get after I hear the facts, okay? So this, the statement number one is not a fact. Okay, that should be easy, I hope, okay? Statement number two, smoking may cause cancer. Okay, many people might say that, oh, that's factual. Not really, no. The pure logic of it, it, that that modal verb, may, you can also call that a weak verb, may, suggests uncertainty. It's also like a prediction. Okay? Facts are, a fact is something that you can use to support an argument, and you can't support an argument with a vague statement like, smoking may cause cancer. What do you mean it may cause cancer? Give me some facts. What do you know? What happened? Okay, so statement number two, also an opinion. Don't worry, I'm going to get to the cause and effect thing, okay? Smoking has been linked to cancer. That's number three. Now, that's a factual statement because it can conceivably be verified. Smoking has been linked to cancer. So I can go look up some study somewhere where some scientist has made drawn some kind of conclusion and he has linked smoking to cancer or she has linked smoking to cancer. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so number three is a factual statement. You could say fact, okay? Then we have number four. This is where the problem begins. Smoking causes cancer? Now the question is, can cause and effect statements really be factual? Can you prove them to be true or false? Okay. You might notice that smoking may cause cancer and smoking causes cancer are very much of the same ilk. Okay. Now, in conventional thinking, and this is what I have to tell, you know, my students, uh, that um, cause and effect statements are normally considered factual. All right. Um, but as you can see here, smoking causes cancer is now becoming a bit fishy because really smoking causes cancer. That statement can be supported by a lot of facts, but the statement itself, how can you prove the cause? Okay, so in other words, some guy, yeah, on, on the one hand, you got, on the one hand, you got some guy smoking. On the other hand, you've got him getting cancer, okay? How can you prove the arrow of causation? That, that line that's being drawn between these two scenarios seems to be imaginary. In other words, all we know is that two things happened. How do we prove that causal vector between the two scenarios? Yeah, so in truth, cause and effect statements are, you know, their, their beliefs or opinions, okay? And they can be supported by facts, all right? But the problem is in the academic world, uh, cause, and effect, cause and effect statements are, tend to be regarded as factual. Um, the reason for that is, is that they are implied facts, okay? So in other words, smoking causes cancer. What we're really doing is we're implying that there have been lots of facts to uh, prove this. Okay, that would be a factual statement, right? So cause and effect statements cannot really be verified. What that brings us to then is that cause and effect doesn't seem to exist. 
this is going to lead to the problem of lusting for results. In Buddhism, <coughs> excuse me, in Buddhism, there are, I don't know if you guys know this, but there are levels of Buddhism. There are uh, deepening layers of the exploration of Buddhism. And when many people uh, try to describe what Buddhism is, they go to the encyclopedia of Buddhism, and then pretty much uh, what you find in the encyclopedia is the first teachings of the Buddha. Okay, and uh, you tend to find the what the what they call the Theravada teachings of Buddhism. Okay, and supposedly these are the teachings that the Buddha first tried to teach to uh, his disciples. Okay, and that's the Four Noble Truths: the truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. Notice the, all the cause and effect here that's going on. Okay, especially the number two: the truth of the cause of suffering, also called the law of cause and effect. Um, and so, what the Buddha was trying to say is that there are things you can that you can do to cause suffering for yourself. But that also means there must be things that you can do to end the suffering. Okay, and the problem with this first lesson or first, you know, um, lesson plan of the Buddha is that this really doesn't quite work. Okay, so you might do all the little tricks that Buddhism teaches you in the Theravada school. And there's no guarantee that the suffering is going to end. This is because, um, mainly because of the lusting for the results. Okay, so maybe we can get to exactly what the problem is here later. There are further teachings of Buddhism that evolved over time. Uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism, they call it the they, they would call the Four Noble Truths to be part of the first tur turning of the Wheel of Dharma. Then there's a second turning of the Wheel of Dharma, which led to the Mahayana school of Buddhism. And then the third turning of the Wheel of the Dharma, which led to the uh, Tantrayana or Vajrayana, uh, the Tantric Buddhism. Okay, And in my opinion, and in many people's opinion, the, the most effective forms of Buddhism are the, the third turning, the, the Tantra the Vajrayana, the Tantrayana school, okay? Uh, and that's the more magical Buddhism. That's the more um, ritualistic, a lot of scientific techniques and things. Um, a very deep form of Buddhism as well, because um, when you get to that level of teaching in Buddhism, you begin to see that cause and effect does not exist. And so this whole idea of the cause of suffering and then causing the end of suffering is like in illusion. And a lot of the effort exerted in the Theravada school is sort of wasted. Okay, it doesn't mean you can't, doesn't mean you cannot achieve enlightenment in the Theravada school. But what's going to happen? You're going to exhaust the teachings and realize that they just don't work. And then in, in that surrender, that giving up, something might click. Okay, and then of course, you're. Uh, and this is what how the deeper teachings of Buddhism evolved when there, a few people were able to give up and surrender and then suddenly enlightenment would strike anyway and they'd be like, aha, all right, there's another way to go about this. So there are deeper teachings of Buddhism that go beyond cause and effect. And this ability to see beyond cause and effect will help us explain why lusting for results ruins your magic. And so what we're getting at now is something called a causal causality. It's a uh, paradox, of course. Um, there's a, I, I seem to recall that there's a great scene in the movie American Gigolo, uh, the one with Richard Gere. And um, I don't know if I'm imagining this, but I seem to recall there was a scene where he was called in to have sex with uh, some rich guy's wife and the rich guy was going to watch and 
it's an uncomfortable scene for the for the wife because she didn't really want that. Uh, she was just trying to please her husband, and he so he was going to watch Richard Gere have sex with his wife. Okay, um, and so she's uncomfortable with it, and he and and the Richard Gere character notices that. All right, uh, and then while well, he begins to help her relax, and then they begin making out, and then she starts really getting into it. For heaven's sake, it's Richard Gere anyway, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, and they really start getting into it, and it starts becoming a, a, a passionate, spontaneous make-out session, and they're starting to get undressed and stuff like that. And suddenly, the husband uh, speaks up and interrupts them and says, no, you're supposed to uh, remove the blouse first, and then you're supposed to uh, bring the, ar the the bra straps down around her arms. Then you're supposed to uh, undress her one breast at a time, and then you're and they're just looking at him like, "Are you kidding me?" Okay, so you could see what's happening there. Something was starting to happen spontaneously, as though no end result were. We, we're not looking for an end result here anymore. Okay, we're just we're just letting it happen. But the uh, the rich guy steps in, and basically he has an idea of the way things need to go. They need to go like this. Okay, and that's that's what's called being goal focused. And this is why lusting for a particular result tends to ruin what's natural. Okay, this is why lusting for a result. But that's one explanation of why lusting for results uh, ruins your magic. Okay, that's a pretty good example, actually. I, I remember seeing that scene. I was already into magic at the time, and I was like, "Aha, that's what Crowley meant." Okay. <laughs> now, was Crowley ever able to let go of his lust for results? No, I don't think so. <laughs> but he knew the principle. A lot of his enlightenment was intellectual it wasn't really heartfelt in fact he had a, some trouble with the heart center i think um the tafara center uh, that's something we can talk about in another video um, the importance of heart versus head in enlightenment all right and so uh many of you are, are probably attracted to magic because you don't like banality maybe not everybody. Some people get into magic because they, they're just looking for a new addiction. Okay, um, But many people are attracted to magic because it's sublime. It has demons in it and it has uh, shadow work to do. And these are the kinds of people who like, they say, oh, I like it when it rains. Sunny days are okay, whatever, but it's better when it rains. I like the dark. I like staying in the shadows, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the idea of liking dark things and being in the shadows and, you know, wearing all black, um, that's really kind of a, a reaction against people who are uh, superficial and saccharine in terms of happiness and sunshine, goody, goody, fun stuff, right? Um so going like delving into the darkness of things, ultimately, that is an attempt to be more full-bodied, to be not only all very sweetness and light, but also darkness. So you want the whole spectrum of things. You respect the entire enchilada. Okay, so delving into the dark of things um, is really more of the psyche's attempt to value its entire. Uh, realm rather than just the sunshine happy realm also the dark moody realm okay and what you'll find is that um this is why i i tend to tell people i really do not like show tunes because show tunes uh, tend to be so desperately cheerful they tend to be like this little dancing guy here okay not all show tunes are like that, okay? So I tend to like musicals that have darker themes to them, like Phantom of the Opera, of course, and uh, but even The Sound of Music has some really challenging um, 
uh, inspiring things going on, which are much more than just um, sweetness and light. Okay, but yeah, for overall, like um, show tunes suffer from that desperate cheerfulness, that one-sidedness, that lusting for a good result. Let's be happy. We've got to be happy. Let's be happy now. This is another reason why I don't seek out comedy movies. And people tend not to understand when I tell them that. Like, um, life is hilarious. Why would I want to go to a comedy? I don't need to establish, I don't need to go after that as a goal. Things are already funny. <laughs> but um, but you can still drag me to go see a comedy movie and, and I'll have a great time. Yeah, of course. Uh, but it's not something I seek out because I don't really lust for results. There's something um, inherently neurotic about that. And uh, it can be... So I, try, I tend to avoid, you know, uh, uh, seeking happiness, at least on the surface, okay? And so we can talk about, well, what is happiness really then? Because somebody who is endlessly cheerful like this is going to end up in a miserable place. It's kind of like that Simpsons episode where um, they go to the restaurant that counts down to the New Year's Eve every hour. And it was, was it Marge says, oh, it must be so wonderful working at a restaurant where you get to count down to, to New Year's Eve every hour. And the waiter's like, somebody, please kill me now. And so a different kind of dancing. Okay. So notice what's happening here is that we're not just trying to express happiness. There's also, we're just trying to express something, something invisible. We don't even know what it is. Like it's being expressed somehow through the motion, through the grace. There's an element of beauty to it. But beauty is not necessarily pretty. Beauty has an element of the sublime to it. It has light and darkness, light and shade. Do you want to listen to Led Zeppelin, which is light and shade, darkness and light? Or do you want to listen to Katrina and the Waves, which is all sweetness and light and saccharine? Katrina and the Waves is nice, but anyway. Um, but of course, uh, many artists bring a lot of shadow with them as well hardness and softness and darkness and light, a full-bodied approach. That's because they are expressing something that's behind the scenes, okay? And if I only want to express the sunshine aspect of something that's behind the scenes, I'm repressing the dark aspect of it, and that leads to trouble, okay? That leads to a problem because that becomes a uh, a goal focus, it becomes lusting for a particular result. If you want to have wonderful things in your life, you must evoke all of them, the dark aspect of them and the light aspect of them, not just the happy sunshine aspect of them. All right, so let's look at the Let's look at the problem with cause and effect, okay? So when, whenever you see something happening, like uh, the guy is smoking and then the guy gets cancer 10 years later, all right, all we really can see is when the guy was smoking, taking a puff, we see this happening, right? And eventually we see the, you know, x-rays or whatever and the blood, the blood tests and the tumors. Uh, and, and, we, and we conclude, oh... One of them must have caused the other. And we see enough evidence over time with many, many different people so that we can conclude that there must be some kind of causal relationship. But in reality, that red arrow there does not exist. Okay, it is inferred. Okay, so cause and effect isn't really there. It's just a convenient fictionalization of what we've seen it's a very useful fiction as well because we can we can anticipate more cancer from smoking and we'd probably be correct not always though okay um and uh but it doesn't mean that cause and effect actually exists 
Yeah, and so if you really want to practice magic, you've got to let go of cause and effect. And of course, there goes the whole definition of magic right there, right? Uh, what is, what's the definition of magic? Um, to cause change in conformity with your will. To cause change. And then suddenly we say, cause and effect doesn't exist. Uh-oh. So, we might come back to this one. Um, so cause and effect is not just a single line. It's also multiple multiple vectors of uh, from co one cause having numerous effects or one effect having numerous causes. Okay. The interesting thing is that you might notice, oh my gosh, this looks like a magic circle with the north, south, east, and west. So things I can do to cause effects to happen in the direction of air, in the direction of water, in the direction of fire, and in the direction of earth, north, south, east, and west. Uh, or there are things that I can work with in terms of air, water, fire, earth that cause an effect in me. Okay. Hmm. Okay, but cause and effect doesn't truly exist. It will seem to exist, though. Okay, let's see if I can. We can get to the heart of this. So the way to look at cause and effect now is that remember that red arrow doesn't really exist. It's only inferred. Okay, so all we see is what appears to be a cause and what appears to be an effect. Okay, now that cause and effect scenario is a drama. There are many different type, types of drama in the universe or beyond the universe. Okay. And these types of drama can be invoked or evoked through magic. Okay. But in, in order for a drama to really be dramatic, it has to have dark elements and light elements. It can't just consist of effects. There must also be causes that are discernible in it. Okay, so it's the whole package of that drama that's important, not just the effect. Okay, so when you are doing magic, um, you are calling upon some particular archetype, some particular deity, some particular spirit. Like a deity has a, new, a number of angels and spirits that are beneath it. In other words, the deity is like the overall theme of the drama. And then we have the greater characters and the lesser characters, which are underneath that theme. And the whole cast of characters um, is that that's the thing that you're you are invoking not just a little piece of it that you want oh I want the end result of that story but that's all I want if you try to conjure up the end result of a particular drama guess what you're also going to get all the other stuff that led to that it's also all part of it okay this is one of the most disturbing things about magic because when you when you get do a ritual to get something you also get all of the other stuff that comes along with the drama of that thing that surrounds that thing. Okay. So when you work in magic, you're calling upon the archetype. It's like the cause and effect, they are perceived to exist within your own dimensional compartment. You're pretty much, let's say you live on a, in, in flatland. Okay. You're, you let's pretend you're two dimensional and, and, uh, and so uh, you're calling a three-dimensional being to come down into your two-dimensional world and um, manifest its drama in your life. Okay, you can try to get only one aspect of the drama, the thing, the, old, the tiny little aspect of the drama that you want. But guess what? 
the whole package comes with it. Okay. Once you realize this, then you can work magic. Okay, so when you call upon a particular archetype, everything that's part of that archetype is also going to be uh, manifesting around that thing. Okay. And so when you do your ritual, you are sort of coaxing, inviting the archetype to happen. Okay, and it can be very helpful when you call upon an archetype to deliberately call upon both the cause and effect elements that happen within one of its myths, let's say, and the light and darkness, the good and evil also, that occur within that archetype's mythology. Okay, um, if you only go for one particular aspect, um, you can't really do that. It doesn't really work. It comes with the whole package, okay? Hmm. So this drama, um, let's say you're calling, you're, you're a two-dimensional being, right? So one way of looking at your magical ritual space is, is that it is a two-dimensional platform where the drama of the universe unfolds. And a three-dimensional entity will can be called down into that to sort of pass through that platform. And as it passes through, it plays out its drama. All these different kinds of things happen and reveal the full-bodied nature of that archetype Okay, as it passes through. Um, Another way to look at your ritual space is, uh, this is more of the Enochian view, where um, the the drama of your life is pretty much in, in the circle right there, and all around it, those are the ethers, and uh, they consist of all these different angels that are sitting there in those various tiers watching your performance. And of course... Um, each of those angels has its own particular kind of drama associated with it. Okay, and you can call upon those angels to, you know, um, send its blessing to you upon the stage, sort of, sort of, and to help you manifest its particular drama. Okay, uh, you could say maybe it might descend into that space, and as it does so, all the things that are around you in that space now begin to, uh, act out that particular angel's drama. Okay, it's kind of like um, the angel is a giant magnet and it passes near the circle there and all the iron filings on that circle now arrange themselves according to the drama that's associated with that angel. Okay, the drama or its magnetic field. Okay, so um, if you think about, um, you know, put the iron filings on the paper and then you hold a magnet underneath the paper and all the iron filings line up around it in a particular pattern. Okay, this is what we're talking about. And what you'll notice is that you call upon a particular angel, you're going to get the entire pattern, not just a little piece of it. Okay. And so uh, once you realize this, then magic becomes something much, much different. Um, and if you were to call upon one of these angels that's sitting in one of the ethers, one of these angels that's sitting in one of those stands, right? Um, it might not come, okay? So another aspect of magic is knowing which angels are coming down and which ones are leaving. So um, what's happening is that you're, a magician tunes into the universe and he'll notice which ones, which angels are coming into manifestation and which ones are leaving manifestation. And he will take advantage of the ones that are entering manifestation. Okay. Um, this is why I sometimes refer to the magician as a midwife because he tunes into uh, reality as though it were a great goddess who is pregnant with something. Reality is always pregnant with something. Something is about to come out. <laughs> okay, um, and, but but sometimes uh, something has already come out and it's already played out its existence and it's on the way out. 
Okay, so a magician is m mostly tuning into what reality is pregnant with. In other words, what's coming next? Aha, let's tune into that. And then when you invoke that, you re remember you're going to uh, get the whole thing. Okay, so and the ability to appreciate the whole thing uh, that you're invoking moment to moment, this is really the experiment, the, the experience of enlightenment. Um, one of the, <laughs> the the secret of enlightenment is something that Krishnamurti gave to his followers, and they were very disappointed with him when he told them what it was. He says, "I'll tell you my secret." And everybody leans in and was listening. It's like, well, he's going to tell us how to become enlightened. And he said, well, my secret is that I really don't mind what happens. Yeah, and so um, what that means is that when something is, when a new reality is coming into being, he doesn't mind the dark aspects of it. There's it has dark aspects, it has light aspects. He takes the whole thing, warts and all. The ability to appreciate both the beautiful and the sublime, to appreciate the whole thing. So you're not just Katrina and the waves anymore, walking on sunshine. You are more like Led Zeppelin, Kashmir. You know that. Um, I hope you understand these references. Um, so your music is both dark and light, not just happy sunshine, goody goody. So hopefully you understand now what it means to when you're lusting for results. Okay, this is the problem with addiction. Um, what does it really mean to be happy or blissed out? Okay, being happy or blissed out is not just being happy and blissed out. That's if you try to go after it that way. Yeah, you can get it, but it becomes cheap, shallow, saccharine and ultimately unfulfilling. You can have the appearance of happiness. It's kind of like taking Zoloft and then you, it's like, am I happy? I seem to be acting like I'm happy, but this isn't really happy, is it? This is really weird. This is a superficial happy act. I'm acting like I'm happy because the brain chemistry seems to be happy, like something like that. Um, so what it really means to be happy is to explore things that are manifesting in their full-bodied nature, in their beautiful aspect and their sublime aspect, in their dark aspect and their light aspect, the whole thing, the causes and the effects, the apparent causes and the apparent effects, the whole thing. So um, I've seen this. You go to a funeral and they're, they're especially women, especially some women who can really, like mothers, who can really mourn. Oh, they can cry. They can cry so hard. Um, and it's like, wow, I wish I could cry like that. She's really enjoying it. Now, that sounds really cruel, you know, because there's obviously suffering going on there. But there, there is a, a sort of unbridled, full-bodied appreciation of the, of the drama of what's happening there. Yeah. So I, um, many people might hear this and say, I don't want that. If that's enlightenment, I don't want that. I don't want to embrace the suffering or embrace the grief. But that's what enlightenment is. You know, like if, if it's time to grieve, you're going to do it. And there's going to be an aspect of pleasure to it. And when it comes time for celebrations and happiness and humor, and joy, there's going to be a dark aspect to that. You're going to appreciate. You're going to appreciate the dark aspect, the ironic aspect of the joy and the and the celebration too. It's the full-bodied experience of of whatever is coming into reality, not just the the part that the um, part that the ego has latched on to. I want this aspect of it. No, 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 no. The whole thing, everything comes at you. 
and then the appreciation of the dark and the light aspects are now fully upon you. Okay, and so when you call upon something to manifest, um, you're doing it because it's already on the way anyway, otherwise it won't come. Uh, and then it's really going to come, and it's really going to come out, and then you can position your life so that you can enjoy it and be ready for it and survive it, and this is the real aspect of magic, okay? Uh, hmm. All right, so I look forward to the comments. Um, this was a pretty deep one, so I'm wondering uh, what you guys might think about it. If you are the type of person who says, oh, I like rainy days, I don't just like sunny days, I like rainy days, you're already on to this thing. You already know what I'm talking about, okay? Or maybe you didn't know why you liked darkness and moodiness and things like that, but now you, now you know, now you know why, because you want the whole thing, you want everything. You don't, you don't want just this feel-good part, the, sh the, the shallow aspect of it. You want the deep end of the pool as well. Okay. All right. Well, until next time.